Hey, good evening, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. It's me solo tonight, trying to make sure that everything works, and sometimes it doesn't. I wanted to do a little sharing on Facebook, and tonight, actually, I'm going to show you the Facebook page that we have. Um, I'll, if if people join us that have never seen it, hi, Osama's joined us. Um, Oh yeah, I read, I, I saw Nicole's show and I read Jason Leopold was on Nicole Sandler's show. BuzzFeed has an, a phenomenal article on really basically corruption, corruption. But I am going to do some different things tonight. I'm just going to see if I can share. Sometimes it doesn't let me. And uh, I didn't plan on a Friday night, but I, oh Wow. Things seem like they're working better than they ever did. Maybe I needed to rotor rooter my my uh hi Dolores. I needed to rotor rooter <laughs> my um modem and everything. Hi Gary. Okay, well I got a good show tonight. I've I've just been uh sharing out. I might sneeze a little. I open the window and there's um whatever there is outside. I don't know. But I'll do one more share, and it's great to have you guys. Uh, who should I share to? How about we try um, Planet Earth Report? There's a good one. Okay. Anyway, and you're all good on on uh, YouTube. All right, so let's get down to business and say hi, uh, Steve Wolbrandt. Okay, we're getting up there in people visiting and I guess there's no uh, uh, problem with uh, with you hearing me John says I buffered six times already it's it, it's either I don't know doesn't look like it's doing that to me on mine but I'm gonna show you our Facebook page I know a lot of people hate Facebook and it's not my favorite all the time uh, Especially with the way, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his nonsense. But uh, we have a page and I'm going to show it to you because what got me started on this was our editor. And his name is Jonathan O. And he he does such good. He brings such good stuff onto the page. The page has almost 15,000 followers. And that doesn't mean, <laughs> hi, I go in south. That doesn't mean um, that 15,000 people look at it every day. But it's a pretty, you know, built up. And I thank him. But he put on, and he got all this stuff today, visual corruption around the world. And he's using this website that I got immediately thought was really great so this is what the page looks like and then i i'm gonna pull up uh and i'm sure a lot of you know hi karen karen's from clear lake and she's good and safe she's marked safe from fire so that's cool it is cool that that you guys are are with me and vanessa kitty is here going south and uh osama all right kim santino dolores we'll get started and what got me here usually stuff kind of geeky stuff you know and it seems like everything's working so this is called our world and data i don't know if you've heard of our world and data this particular um publication they it's where i lifted the uh material for my for the 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 stream and it they start talking about poverty disease hunger climate change war existential risks and inequality the world faces many great and terrifying problems it is these large problems that our work at our world in data focuses on thanks to the work of thousands of researchers around the world who dedicate their lives to it we often have a good understanding how it is possible to make progress against these large program you know problems we're facing the world has the resources to do much better i don't know 
I don't know if we have the political will and reduce suffering in the world. And suffering is a, a, a big thing. And there's a lot of us here that suffer, you know, so there's a lot of people that suffer. Okay. So it starts out pretty good. And I'm, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's just the point of our world and data. And it's a publication. So you can use this to your advantage, which I did. It's, it, it, if, it, it, really, I'm going to show you. It, it, uh, is it possible to change the world? We're not going to go through all these big questions. So I'm going to go next because if we go through all these big questions, we'll be here forever. And and what I wanted to do was specifically pick out population and look at population, look at energy through this tool, and then look at food. Oh, Kim Centeno. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> I always say the New York sound. Sorry, Centeno. That's our mod, and I said it. I said her name wrong, and I am just apologizing again. Jennifer and I seem to have these language barriers <laughs> with everything. <laughs> Hi, Karen Peterson. All right, so where my brain took me tonight was to use this and talk about this. This talk about population, and then energy use and food that's those are the big problems and then i'm going to wind up with refu you know climate change migration which is going to be pretty interesting winding up so the fast <clears throat> this fascinating world map was drawn based on country populations this was from 2018 and I have a newer one from 2020, you know, 2020, where we are now in the twilight zone. Because in 2018, even though things were crazy, did we ever think they were going to get this crazy? Uh, did we ever think it was going to get this crazy? There was a comment I wanted to see. Okay, going south. Ask the hard questions first. Do we want it to change? And who's we? Yes, there's a lot of people that don't want change. There's a lot of people that want the status quo. There's a lot of people that don't believe that we need to change. So this whole world map, which goes in by population in 2018, uh, make it larger so you can see the United States in 2018 had 326.8 million people. Mexico, 130 million. And Brazil, 210 million. Peru, 32.6 million. Chile, 18.2 million. Then we go into Africa and you can see the different populations. 51 in Kenya, 51 million. And the Congo, 84 million. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of human beings. And as these countries get more uh, westernized, they want, the middle class wants to use energy. They want better food. They want to industrialize. And we have a quandary with climate change and, and people's way of living in other countries rising which it is a conundrum because of climate change iran has 82 million pakistan has 200 million people india 1.354 billion bangladesh small place 166 million china 1.45 billion so this world has a lot of grubby little fingers on it. This world has a lot of people, a lot of people. And uh, those people have to live in places. And they used a, you know, uh, it's, it's quite stark to think about this, the overwhelming, it is, it's overwhelming, the amount of people in, on this planet, using the resources of this planet. 
regardless of where they are, there's resources. But of course, the westernized countries, the industrialized countries and the wealthier countries use way more resources. But the benchmark is to be like the United States and Europe. That's what everybody wants. That's what they want, you know, and that's what they say. The whole world is about basically about marketing. It's all about marketing. All about it. So this map starts with the cartogram. That's what they call it. To get around the challenges of relying on the standard world map, this guy Rosser made a population cartogram. What is it? It's a, vis a visualization in which statistical make sure you're up statistical information is shown in diagrammatic form and i love this stuff <laughs> i'm a geek in this case this is a population cartogram which er, where each square in the map represents 500,000 people in a country's population so in a total there are 15 here there are 15,266 squares representing all 7.633 billion people on the planet and that was 2018. So you can look at Asia and Oceania. Where did Australia go? So the continent is completely dwarfed by neighboring Indonesia and the Philippines in data, you know, in data, in data. So I'm going to go on and I want to go up to the next article, which now we're coming back to our current uh, current times. And I see people are joining us. I'm not usually on Friday night. And this was the last minute thing. And it's awfully early for me. I'm usually on at seven, uh, nine o'clock Eastern. But I really wanted to. I really wanted to, to, to do this, to get on and also see if it was working. Everything was back technologically because I had a, <laughs> what a week, what a week, what a week, what a week. So world population peak, the top 10 countries and by 2100. Now we all know, a lot of us know that 2100, that elusive number the number that <laughs> most of us don't think that the planet at least humans will make it to with the global population surpasses will it surpass by the end of the century 10 billion by the end of the century the arctic is at the lowest ice it's been i think torstein can tell us that and our hurricanes and our fires and the weather problems and the climate changes and all of the things that are happening 2100 sounds like some futuristic date that will never happen guess i'm my uh what doom scroller <laughs> all right so global population projections here by 2100 over a quarter of the world <laughs> will be aged 65 and above by 2100. I will be dead <laughs> by then. So who the hell knows how long I'll make it. And sometimes who in the hell cares? Sometimes I think that it will be a relief to be out of it, out of the pain every single day. Uh, so the global peak population is supposed to happen according to this in 2064. So I'm not sure in this particular article that they factored in climate change deaths or even, I don't know, maybe they did factor in, let's go down. I don't remember if they factored in pandemics. Uh, top countries by population in 2100. So China was uh, 1.4 billion and then India is projected to be 1.9 billion and uh, India 1.38 billion and Nigeria 791 billion um, 2100 that's what was you know 2100 but we had already seen what these different countries were in the big map 
where it said India was 1.354 billion and now in the same thing uh, India is going to be 1.38 billion so obviously statistically they're they'll level out by 2100 maybe possibly so this is giving us the demographic fair uh, factors they say from lower fertility rates to higher life expectancies they're key reasons behind differing estimates because you can go back to that other that other uh 2018 map and uh okay what oh Shitsi says wait a minute i gotta put this one up because i guess i am aren't i i am he said, I sound like a baby boomer when I say that. They always say that stuff. I'll be gone. Good luck, kids. I didn't say good luck, kids, because I don't I, I, I don't know what kind of luck they're going to have. And I have one I will leave behind. So uh, I don't know if I can say good luck. I can say I feel like shit. I can say I'm part of the problem. What is that going to do, though? So, you know, we make our mea culpas however we can. Capish. Okay, so next we're going to look at, oh, they, they say by country, and they, they have population estimates that it'll rise by 2100 to 10.9 billion, provided some cataclysmic uh, extinction level event to humans doesn't happen. I am not a prognosticator. I am not. I am a citizen scientist and I am bringing you data to look at from a source that you could go back and use yourself. Uh, in this article, they were, they said, and so we're using 2100. Would it be any difference if they used 2050? I think basically we're... Uh, all going to be the same anyway, overpopulated and not enough food. But after I did population tightly packed together, they said that how it would look, um, how density will be with many more people clustered in the same areas. For example, Nigeria is dealing, is dealing with a land area nearly 11 times smaller than the U.S., but will have more than double the population. How? I don't know. I don't know. We're having pandemics now and it, it it's and the United States is leading the way in deaths. So my guess is off. Uh, the next article is energy and I thought we would segue into energy because populations are going to need energy and it's going to go up and the Green New Deal and everything that's been talked about in these projections, maybe these projections are more realistic than, let's say, uh, a projection of a, um, what is it, a techno-utopian who will say that technology will be much more than what it's represented in this, in this uh, article, in this energy, charting the flows of energy consumption. So this is 1969 to 2018, but this article came from 2020. And I think it's interesting as hell. <laughs> you know, I, I, I sometimes really wish, I, I miss statistics. I, I miss jumping into this stuff. So here in this article, in this energy consumption here, you're gonna see the total and you're going to see the non-renewable resources. Now, this is in the past. This is not going forward right now. We're looking at what was, which I, I just don't see it changing so fast. Uh, I see Karen and Basil are here. That's really great. Oil, coal, gas, 22.8% in gas. And then there's the renewables, which are hydropower, 6.7%. Nuclear, 4.6%. <clears throat> excuse me, other 0.9%, wind, small amount, solar, 0.4%. So it was so small, tiny little budget of solar. I mean, you know, we, we, <laughs> we could have been doing these things how many years ago, but we've had nothing but impediments. 
we've had the knowledge, but we've been a we've been a really uh, we haven't been a smart species. We have all this intelligence, but we seem to not have any common sense. So all these different countries, it's really interesting in the color flow. I really do like this visual capitalist. Uh, let's look at what country would any of you like to see? Would you like to see, I think he's talking about Norway. Let's go down to find um, L-M-N-O-P, Norway. Okay, uh, if I can make it bigger, Norway has a lot of yellow. Oh God, this is going to make us dizzy, which is hydropower. Norway has a lot of hydropower and uh, the black and the green. Boy, I wish this was a movable scale. The black oil, oil, hydropower, and it was green, which looked like coal. Is that about uh, accurate for those years for Norway? And then we can look at, for an example, oh, Slovakia. Slovakia's got pink in there. So Slovakia has a lot of new, well, yeah, they have nuclear energy. Let's see if I, if I make this bigger. I wonder if I can make this bigger. France and Slovakia. France has quite a bit of nuclear energy or had, right? <laughs> oh, I like this chat. I don't, I, I can't put it up yet, but look at all the countries and look at all the energy. Norway has quite a lot of hydro. New Zealand has hydro. Peru has hydro. Actually, my house is hydro, like 87% coming from Niagara Falls. Uh, let's see, where's good old United States? We are, what, the leaders in oil for the last gazillion years? Oil. Okay, so green, black, purple, blue. Yeah, we have teeny weeny good stuff and lots of bad stuff. Okay. So, uh, I mean, there's my, my scientific uh, um, analysis. We have a lot of bad stuff, a lot of carbon burning stuff, and not that much good stuff. But is there any good energy use? I mean, every energy source leaves behind something. And for those people that say, nuclear, it's clean, it doesn't leave CO2, but then there's the whole other part of radioactive waste. Uh, nothing's perfect. There's nothing. Unless we just live with campfires <laughs> in uh, igloos or stone houses. And I don't think there'll be any igloos left once the Arctic is fully melted. That will be a, a way of life. And it's already a way of life that the indigenous people are losing. So they're charting energy consumption by source and country. And there, oh, there is an interactive. Okay, so over the last 50 years, the world has seen a colossal increase in energy consumption. And with the uh, ongoing transition to renewables, it's interesting to look at how these sources of energy have been evolving over time. So let's try clicking on this and see if the interactive version is any more helpful. And to see about energy use, I don't know if this is really anything other than <laughs> just a bigger view. I honestly don't know. But of course, we're seeing the, the thing go around and around because of the fact that... Mm. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's see if you can click... All right, Australia. I click on Australia. And we get, in five minutes, who the hell knows where the tower is here? We get, um, mm, let's see. It's going to, if it's going to do this, oh, <gasps> go. What happened to it? It came on and then it left. <laughs> Shit. Oop. Yeah, this is sad. <sighs> it's really sad. We really need to lobby for broadband here. I'd rather have it dug in the ground. It's not going to leak. It's not like an oil pipeline. I don't like the Wi-Fi because God knows you can't see what's coming in your house. All right. Energy consumption. Gas, 1989 to 1988 in Australia. Terawatt hours from gas, 1802. Well, there it goes. It's gone. Uh, 
How about Canada? Canada's got a big consumption of oil. I'm really sorry that I've got this um, shitty ass rural internet that you can't even do a presentation. Can you imagine if I was a teacher, which I wish I could be, you know, but if I was a teacher and working from this gosh darn okay here's bulgaria working from this place bulgaria energy consumption so it tells you the total terawatt hours how much so from coal all right for example so it is nice it's an interactive map but the only problem is is that my internet stinks so i'm not gonna i'm i'm not gonna subject you guys to this all right we'll go down though but you get the idea a tarot what well First, let's take a look at which sources have produced the most energy over the last decade of data. Energy consumption is measured in terawatt hours, which is TWH, a unit of energy equal to outputting 1 trillion watts for an hour. And I want to learn all of this stuff personally. I want to learn it all because I would like to go solar and I want to learn all about the measurements. Okay, so energy source, percent of energy consumption, some, and we're going again in the past, but the energy source of oil is the highest in, um, in the, the output, in the terawatts. So oil and coal, that has been our, our staple around the world. We've used a lot of them. And fossil fuels, as the predominant source of energy, fossil fuels collectively accounted for a massive 86.2% of total energy consumption over 2009 to 2018, <laughs> or roughly 1.2 um, TWH is. I like to say, if I could say twa terawatts, but that wouldn't sound right. We, we, we use twat? Okay, twat did we use? <laughs> um, the thing is here, it, it's not good. And would it have mattered you know, I was listening on Black Bear News today and they were talking about how Gore v. Bush and that election was basically stolen and hijacked. And 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 of course, we can't do the woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know, all those things because that's the past. But the question was, would we be in a different situation? Would we be? Uh, would we be? At maybe 312 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Would we be zipping around like the Jetsons in electric vehicles already? Would houses be? But you can't look back because this is where we are. We are stuck in the twilight zone. We are in the, well, what did uh, Osama say? Um, we, we, WM, we, WMBF. WMBF. I'll let you guys in the chat figure that one out. Uh, okay, so the data is interesting. And uh, renewals, only 13.8% of energy consumption over that time came from renewals. And setting up alternative power plants, especially wind, solar, nuclear, require significant capital investment while facing competition from cheaper and more convenient fossil fuels. So it goes down to money and uh, top 10 countries relying on fossil fuels. So 43 of these 64 countries sourced more than 80% of their energy. And you look at that, you'd be surprised, right? Uh, Oman was number one, 100% from gas. Saudi Arabia, and you know this one, right, was 100% from oil. That's like, you know. Israel had 98.1%. Israel is definitely not green. Hong Kong is not green. None of them are. Qatar, my God. But then top 10 countries, now they call this using alternative energy sources, was the energy mix looks like a portfolio Iceland had a uh, 81.6% of hydropower so they're like the closest to where I live because I have 87 point whatever it is from the falls and uh, I would love to have solar though because when the shit hits the fan I really want to be self-sufficient here as 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 painful as it is <laughs> okay so then there's Norway 
following uh, with the alternative sources, and it shows you they're calling, and France, 47% with nuclear. That's That was in, going in the past. And uh, Austria has hydropower. I guess hydropower, yeah, it's, I mean, of course, nothing is hydropower when they build the dams and if any new dams screws up ecosystems. It's, it, it, they call it renewable or they call it, you know, clean, but it, it's nothing to an ecosystem to just destroy it. So everything has a cost. Everything has an ecological cost. Everything that humans have done for our energy has an ecological cost. So we're at uh, the transition. Are we on track? Well, this was 2008. So let's go to the next chart that I did. All right. So we're going to kind of, we're going to kind of switch gears. We are going to wrap up towards food. So we talked about population and we talked about energy and we saw who uses what. And now we're going to look at food and there's a lot in food and I have been 32 minutes. So this is good. We've, we've got food and we've got a decent, um, a decent crowd. Thank you for joining me to, um, uh, join me on my uh, travels into geekdom tonight. All right. So the carbon footprint of food supply chain. And we all know that there's going to be food shortages, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of problems with the way our food supply chain is as well. So it says in, in our world and data, there are greenhouse gas emissions across the supply chain. Um, let's see if I, I want to see if it comes bigger because I really don't know if you could see. I'll just make it big. Land use change. Above ground changes in biomass and from deforestation and below ground changes in soil carbon and then to the farm. See, there's a vast difference in greenhouse gases, GHGs, that are produced across various food types. But basically, it's land use to the farm which then talks about the methane emissions from cows, methane from rice, emissions from fertilizers, uh, manure, farm machinery, every which way we, we look, there's, you know, again, like energy, our food production sucks <laughs> for the environment. Animal feed, on-farm emissions from crop production and its processing, or production uh, and its processing into the feed for livestock. Then processing emissions from energy, use in the process of converting raw agricultural products into final food items. And then of course there's the transportation. And that is a whole, a whole uh, show in itself on, there is a, an expert actually on transportation. I don't remember her name. She did a phenomenal body of work on YouTube that uh, her video showed what would happen without our transportation system. We rely on transportation systems for every single thing. And even the most homestead of us need transportation to get a lot of the things we have. And that's just it. It is. So the, uh, all right, we'll go down to how much the, for example, GHG, greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of a food product. This is something we all know. The beef is the highest amount between everything. Methane production, any, getting it there, you know, beef. Beef, lamb, mutton, cheese. Ooh, you know, I don't want, oh. Okay, here's something I'm guilty. <sighs> Probably not as much chocolate, but a lot of coffee. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, see, there you go. A lot of coffee, 17 GHGs. Uh, coffee doesn't have much, but it's a high carbon footprint. And a lot of us drink coffee, don't we? And something that's horrible, palm oil. Don't buy it. Check everything you buy. Don't buy it. And it goes down. Then we talk about olive oil, which uh, do have, it does have a cost, a, a, an environmental cost. 
Pigs and poultry are non-ruminant livestock, so they do not produce methane. They have significantly lower emissions than beef and lamb, but they still have shit pits. So every big uh, poultry, uh, uh, pig farm, especially in North Carolina, and they always worry about this with storms, has shit pits. You know, it, it all goes at, down into these pits. It's supposed to not pollute the waterways, but somehow it always does. It always does. And so the people that live down there near pig factories have to put up with all of this. So I guess nuts, it says nuts and citrus fruits and apples are lower in CO2 emissions from these. And let's see, let's take tomatoes, which actually I grew, so I'm never going to buy any tomatoes. I can't grow I would like to learn how to grow wheat and rye. I have to ask when, and when, uh, yes, they are. Okay. So CO2 emissions from most plant-based products are as much as 10 to 50 times lower than most animal-based. It's enough for me to not want to ever eat another animal unless my husband gets his because he's never going to stop doing what he does. Factors such as transport, distance, retail, packaging, or specific farm methods are often small compared to the importance of the food type. So basically, our Western diet of, all, well, yeah, of, of all this shit, we don't need. We don't need beef. We don't need lamb. We, we, we really, we could do without cheese. I like cheese, but we could do without it. We could do without a lot of stuff. And you know what? We're going to have to do without a lot of stuff. So we just went through that whole thing with the environmental impact. So population, as we started, we started with population has a, an environmental impact. And then energy use on the planet, environmental impacts, negative. Food environmental impacts, the, the, the way that we are doing all of that today. Uh, let's look at, uh, well, we already said that with the highest amount, the, the beef and the lamb, so I don't need to go. Now then there's the, the, the food supply chain, right? With, from land use. I mean, each one of these could be a show I could do on each one of these, which actually might be kind of interesting. Packaging is my is the big thing that drives me out of my mind. Well, it it, it, it transport and processing, ugh, it's all horrible. I mean, in the United States and all over the world, it is what is it? Jobs, 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 jobs. They're all jobs, all about jobs because everybody's got to work in this economy. Capitalism, jobs. You know, you have to have to work, 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 work. And I'm not saying you shouldn't work. I'm just saying I wish there was a different way. Uh, I want to go down. Just actually, the packaging annoys me. I don't know if they went in all the way through. No, I, they did not. But that, again, could be a, a show. All in its own. So transport, they talk about land use farm stages of supply chain account for 80% of the uh, emissions. In beef production, for example, there are three uh, key contributing factors to the carbon footprint at these stages, the animal feed, land conversion, and methane production. So when our vegan friends talk about being vegan as a good thing, it's a good thing. Trust me. And I'm not vegan, but I'm working on changing a lot of things. I have to. I have to change. Change is a good thing, guys. Change is a good thing. Um, plant alternatives, oh, plant-based alternatives. They're talking about the beyond meat and the things like that. Uh, it's over my, over my pay grade. So, so my last thing with this really interesting website, which I just loved. And I, I mean, there were, there's so many different, different, uh, articles, so many different things you can do with this. Uh, the um, visualcapitalist.com website. Interesting as hell. I mean, if I was going to be writing a report or I was going to do a research project, this is not a bad website. Back when I was in college 150 years ago and you went to the sit in the library and, you know, <laughs> it was a whole lot different than what's, what's right at your fingertips. 
it's amazing. It is amazing. And uh, so I'm going to wrap up with something. I went through, again, we went through the population. We went through energy. We went through food production. And all of this is going to lead to this. I mean, you see it right there. It's a little sped up, but this is an article in ProPublica. And it's a pretty friggin' scary. If you ask me, this is pretty scary, the way they sped it up. Look at the homes. And yes, it's fast, but this is what happens. And oh, and, and, and the populations are, are going out in California and in the West into places they shouldn't be building. And drought makes it horrible. It's pretty scary. And it's frightening for people that live in California, like Karen, who's with us, our, our, our beloved Karen Reese, who, who, what a time she's had. So when you talk about population, a lot of people think of all the other countries I had shown. But climate change is going to force this new American migration. And let's see how long we've been. Okay, I'm going to give it another couple of minutes. We know about all this. Uh, ProPublica is a pretty good uh, uh, publication. So I want to go down to uh, that when they talk about 900 blazes incinerated six times as much land as all the state's 2019 wildfires combined. I mean, it's it's overwhelming, and we. Do you ever feel a little numb to all this if you're, it's not in front of you? Three of the largest fires in history burned simultaneously in a ring around the San Francisco Bay Area. Another fire burned just 12 miles from the author's home in Marin County. Jennifer and I had been talking about Marin County last night. We discovered we didn't know. We both grew up there as children in the same, you know, same county. She wasn't that far from me. <laughs> uh, like many Californians, I spent those weeks worrying about what might happen next before an inferno of 60-foot flame swept up the steep grassy hillside on its way towards my own house, reversing, rehearsing in my mind what my family would do to escape. But I also had a longer-term question about what would happen once this unprecedented fire season ended. Was it time to leave for good? So this author keeps, there. he's been studying how climate change will influence global migration, but it's happening in the United States. The potential movement of hundreds of millions of climate refugees across the planet stands to be among the most important. He traveled, wait, is it a she or he? I'm sorry, I didn't say who's the name. Abraham. Oh, Abram Luff's garden. Abram Luff's garden. Okay. And we talked about this last night. I think in the, it was a, a snippet of this. But this person, it, it's interesting. It's, he's talking about what's going to happen. Relocation no longer seemed like such a distant prospect. Like the subjects of my reporting, climate change has found me. It's indiscriminate forces erasing all semblances of normalcy. Suddenly, I ask myself the very question I've been asking others. Is it time to move? I am far from the only American facing such questions. This summer has seen more fires, more heat, more storms, all of it making life increasingly untenable in the larger areas of the nation. Already, droughts regularly threaten food crops across the West. We were talking about transporting those foods, but you have to have the food to transport, don't you? Uh, while destructive floods inundate towns and fields from the Dakotas to Maryland, collapsing dams in Michigan and raising the shorelines of the Great Lakes. Rising seas and increasingly violent hurricanes are making thousands, thousands of Americans shoreline, American shoreline nearly 
a mile, sorry, nearly uninhabitable. As California burned, Hurricane Laura pounded the Louisiana coast with 150 mile an hour winds, killing at least 25 people. It was the 12th named storm to form by that point in 2020. Another record. Phoenix, meanwhile, endured 53 days of 110 degree heat, 20 more days than the previous record. And I'll tell you, I'm thinking, I know why the property's selling where I live because people are leaving the West to come to the East <laughs> as climate refugees, climate change refugees. So for years, Americans have avoided confronting these changes in their own backyards. The decisions we make about where to live are distorted not just by politics that play down climate risks, but also by expensive subsidies and incentives aimed at defying nature. In much of the developing world, the vulnerable people will attempt to flee the emerging perils of global warming, seeking cooler temperatures, more fresh water and safety. But here in the United States, people have, gra uh, have largely gravitated toward environmental danger, building along coastlines from New Jersey to Florida and settling across the cloudless deserts of the Southwest. I wanted to know if this was beginning to change. Might Americans finally be waking up to how climate change is about to transform their lives? And if so, if a great domestic relocation might be in the offing, was it possible to project where we might go? So this guy, he, he um, interviewed a lot of people and did a lot of work here for this article. And I don't want to read the whole thing in the interest of time, but he did find, he says, the nation of a cusp of a great transformation, which we know across the United States, some 162 million people. Now, isn't that like half the population? Nearly one in two will most likely experience a decline in the quality of their environment, namely more heat and less water. For 93 million of them, the changes could be particularly severe. And by 2070, uh, our analysis suggests if carbon emissions rise at extreme levels, at least 4 million Americans could find themselves living at the fringe in places decidedly outside the ideal for niche life. And this, my friends, is not alarmism. This, my friends, is what's happening. It is absolutely what's happening and we've seen it. The cost of resisting the new climate reality is mounting. Florida officials have already acknowledged that by uh, defending some roadways against the sea, but it'll be unaffordable. So there's another one. This was the uh, Azusa fire watching the Ranch 2 fire. Look at that. Let me see if I can make that bigger. The orange it's just two weeks ago. <sighs> so then what? All right. How it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. It's going to eat away at prosperity, dealing repeated economic blows to coastal, rural and southern regions, which could in turn push entire communities to the brink of collapse. This is where we are, folks. This process has already begun in rural Louisiana and coastal Georgia, where low income and black and indigenous communities face environmental change on top of poor health and extreme poverty. Mobility itself, a, gl a global migration experts point out, oops, point out, uh, is often a reflection of relative wealth. And as some move, many others will be left behind. Well, they're going to be left behind. <sighs> Those who stay risk becoming trapped as our land, as the land and society around them ceases to offer any more support, like what's happening in the permafrost areas. There are signs that the message is breaking through. Half of Americans now rank, rank climate as a top political priority up from roughly one-third in 2016, and three out of four now describe climate change as either a crisis or a major problem. 
This year, Democratic caucus goers in o Iowa, where tens of thousands of acres of farmland flooded in 2019, ranked climate change second only to health care as an issue. So we see it has already begun. Look at this picture. Let me bring this one up. And this one is uh, Pedro Delgado harvesting a, a, a cob of blue corn that grew without kernels in Arizona because of the heat. And, you know, the other day I passed by cornfields that were kind of brown, but I don't know what it was. I don't know why they hadn't cut them yet. Uh, and here, let's get started with some basics. Across the country, it's going to get hot. Buffalo, New York. may feel like in a few decades like Tempe, Arizona does today. And Tempe itself will sustain 100 degree average summer temperatures by the end of the century. Again, a little hopium here, <laughs> provided that humans appear at the end of the century. And I'm not sitting here saying I'm a, you know, extinction uh, i'm supporting extinction or any of it i'm simply saying what could be what could be uh extreme humidity from new orleans to northern wisconsin will make summers uh increasingly unbearable turning otherwise seemingly survivable heat waves into debilitating health threats Going on, much of the Ogallala Aquifier, which supplies nearly a third of the nation's irrigation groundwater, could be gone by the end of the century. So let's go down and get more depressed. Uh, in California, nearly one in three people here will leave Marin County. Hmm. A lot of people. And that's it just from sea level rise, he says. And from Maine to North Carolina to Texas, rising sea levels are not just chewing up shorelines, but also raising the rivers and swamping the subterranean infrastructure of coastal communities. It's a, it's a really good article. ProPublica really does have good stuff. Americans have been conditioned not to respond to geographical climate threats as people in the rest of the world do. Duh. People in America are conditioned to be clueless fucking morons. So Americans are richer, more richer. They're insulated from some of the shocks of climate change, but they in L.A., a lot of people, California, temperate, didn't need air conditioning. Now they're sweating. You know, it's, it's happening. It's really happening. Uh, census data. We're going to see the census this year, too. But Americans go towards heat, towards coastline, towards drought, <laughs> regardless of evidence of increasing storms and flooding and other disasters. Wow. That's what they do. Look at that. Just, you know, just a house. Just a house. Another house. The sense that money and technology can overcome nature has emboldened Americans. Where money and technology fail, though it inevitably falls to government policies and government subsidies to pick up the slack. <sighs> Need I go on? It's a pretty long article, and I suggest that in the interest of time, you guys look at, the, look at it and read it. It's interesting, and you'll learn a lot, as I have. And it's been interesting being with you tonight. Uh, <laughs> hi, Hooples. Fake census, fake weather, everything is fake. No. <laughs> well, we know it's not. But uh, I don't live in land, the land of alternative facts. Unfortunately, the United States is really headed to the land of super stupid. And what's going to happen without science? We will fall behind in everything. Mm -hmm. except we will have lots of mega churches and lots of lots of pregnant young girls but i will say i just think that the youth if uh, it goes the way of taking women's rights close your legs and why can't men have uh tubal ligations why can't they have their tubes snipped why can't they get snipped force them <laughs> So if they don't want, yeah, Gary, environmental social suicide. 
And Violet said, we may as well stay put and cross our fingers. I don't think we have any other choice. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm, I'm not thinking of leaving anywhere, although, you know, we were, uh, we were fantasizing a little bit about getting even more remote and rural land away from people, but I need a good internet connection. <laughs> so, oh Lord, hoops, one of my subs put up an energy weapons, did the fires video, World words fail me. Obviously, education failed that person. Or... It's because of the internet. The internet that can be for such great things has fostered a psychosis. And it's a psychosis that seems to be going worldwide. And I find that uh, all of you, Cindy and Violet and Karen and, and, and all of you, John Schmidt, uh, Microsoft Word technical support, it'll all come out. In the wash eventually, as it were, I just wish there was a way that caused less death and suffering and misery. Yeah. And it will come. It will come. <sighs> All right, guys. I thank you for coming. And uh, hopefully everything will be good on Sunday for Jennifer and myself to do a great show for you. I like this Friday night early. It wasn't bad. Really, it really wasn't bad. So, well, something to look at, but you know with me. So I, I, I have to go on how I feel, and sometimes I just can't do a show. I just can't do a show. Rich Diana, all that falls shall rise again. Uh, Nostradamus. <laughs> we all need to go and live in condominiums. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yes, very good. Oh, Rich says, wait, keep your hands off my tubes. I didn't know you had tubes. You have little tubes. Men have tubes. They Men men get, uh, yeah. Hi, Isabel. She says, conspiracy theories are spreading faster than the virus. <laughs> and I'll end with thank you and peace always. Give you a couple minutes. Peace out, guys. Thank you for coming. Mwah. <laughs>